Coming to you in 2018 from Brick House in downtown Brooklyn, this is 112BK. On the show today, mental health challenges and the LGBTQ community, a play about New York's first African-American congressman, and preserving and presenting family memories. Hi, welcome to the show. I'm Ashley Ford, and welcome back. I'm so glad to be back here with you. 2017, what a year, right? But it's over, and now we're in a shiny new year, 2018. Did that polar bear plunge at Coney Island when it was 17 degrees out give the borough the collective cleanse we all needed? Probably not if the first week of the year is any indication. I choose to approach this year optimistically. If for no other reason, then why not? But I want to hear from you. I want to take your temperature, Brooklyn. I know, it's cold outside. Well, not as cold this week as it was last week, thankfully. But what's on your mind? What are you concerned about? Who do you want to hear from? Whose feet do you want held to the fire? Let me know. Email us at 112BKcomments at brickartsmedia.org. I look forward to hearing from you. And on the show today, some challenges in the LGBTQ community concerning mental health. An actor fulfilling a role he was destined for and preserving family memories in pictures and on screen. But first, these things. We have a new interim U.S. attorney in New York's Eastern District, which includes Brooklyn. His name is Richard P. Donahue, and he's got some interesting decisions ahead of him. Will he charge NYPD officer Daniel Pantaleo with civil rights violations in connection with what the medical examiner labeled the homicide of Eric Garner in Staten Island in July 2014? The grand jury decision later that year not to indict Pantaleo set off a wave of protests citywide. Also on Donahue's plate, the trial of Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, notorious Mexican drug kingpin. That trial is scheduled to start in April. Donahue was tapped, it seems, because as district attorney in Long Island, he prosecuted members of the Salvadorian gang MS-13. Speaking of MS-13, it's hard to overlook the current administration's fixation on the gang and the use of them as boogeymen to vilify all foreign nationals from Central America who reside in this country, which leads us to today's decision to eject nearly a quarter of a million Salvadorians here on temporary protected status. Despite calls for an extension, that status was revoked, affecting more than 4,000 in New York City alone. And did you guys watch the Golden Globes last night? I did. I mean, I watched all of it, which is maybe terrible, but also is quite amazing. Um, <laughs> or at least for me, I love the dresses, I love the films, I love actors and actresses. But the best part of last night was Oprah. And I think anybody who watched the show would say that the best part was Oprah and the rousing speech she gave at the end. Of course, as soon as the speech was over, the internet lit up. It absolutely blew up with people talking about how Oprah should or is absolutely running for president. Of course, Oprah Winfrey herself has said nothing either way. Unfortunately, when these things come out, especially when they're about, you know, brilliant billionaire black women, of which there's pretty much Oprah, uh, the smear campaigns begin pretty immediately. And that's what we're seeing today. People explaining all the reasons why Oprah isn't qualified to be our next president and why it would be a bad idea. And listen, I get it. Who wants another celebrity president, to be perfectly honest? I don't. I think I'm off that. I think Trump pretty much cured me of any desire to see a famous celebrity person sit in the Oval Office. However, what we're not going to do is undermine the decades of good work, service-oriented and otherwise, that Oprah Winfrey has done in this country for us, for herself, and as a representative of black women everywhere. Whether she runs or not, who cares? Stay tuned. We'll be right back with two activist members of Brooklyn's LGBTQ community to talk about mental health, stigma, and the lack of resources available. We all know about post-holiday depression. It hits hardest in January. Mental health conditions can indeed be triggered by external factors. And this is certainly the case for those in the LGBTQ community. 
Those triggers can include cultural stigma and prejudice, and in the case of many people of color, the situation is often worse because of a reluctance to access mental health care. That's if they can even find or afford it. Last month, right before our Be Her town hall meeting, Mental Health as a Civil Right, I sat down with two activists, Kenyon Farrow, the U.S. and Global Health Policy Director for the Treatment Action Group, and Anton B. Craigwell from DGBM, which focuses on mental health and LGBTQ people of the black diaspora. Here's that conversation. The first thing that I want to ask both of you, um, and I'd love to start, though, with your response, Antoine, is about the conflation of mental health and LGBTQ people of color and where your concerns, because both of you work in this space, comes from when it comes to these two groups. The issue of mental health and LGBT, mm -hmm. and when we talk LGBT, let's talk LGBT people of color. Yes. Because there is a certain kind of generalization that captures LGBT and assumes everybody is the same. Mm -hmm. But LGBT people of color are distinctly different because of racism mm -hmm. and because of homophobia. Absolutely. We're not saying that homophobia doesn't exist in the white community. Mm -hmm. There is. Absolutely. But in the black and people of color communities, racism and homophobia are two of the key underlying factors that set them apart. Mm -hmm. In the wider LGBT community, the issue of non-acceptance for who you are mm -hmm. at a very young age precipitates that decline into mental health destabilization. Right. Okay? If you happen to be a person of color who's discovering at a young age, 10, 11, 12, that you're different and you're not going to be accepted for who you are, then coupled with that racism, coupled or added on with the, with the, the religiously influenced or fueled homophobia, mm -hmm. your mental health destabilization is faster and more intense. Can you talk to me a little bit about your work in this space, can you? Sure. Um, so uh, I also you know, work uh, on um, LGBT issues specific, specifically around people of color, and um, the last several years have been working specifically um, in HIV. Right. Um, and I think what we see, um, so first of all, I mean, we know that um, particularly black and brown people are disproportionately impacted by the HIV AIDS epidemic in the United States mm -hmm. writ large. Uh, and then when you look even further, you see that, um, you know, black gay and bisexual men and black transgender women are more impacted than anybody in the United States. Absolutely. Um, and so when we talk about the issue of mental health and HIV, I think we're talking about it from um, a couple different vantage points, one of which is um, we still have such a great deal of stigma around having an HIV diagnosis in the right. United States in general, and, and globally, actually, but mm -hmm. specifically in the United States, um, there's a stigma of being HIV positive, despite how far we've come with medications and the knowledge that, you know, if people are on medications and are, you know, virally suppressed or undetectable, that they can't transmit the virus. Mm -hmm. the, you know, we have all that kind of science behind us, but we still have great deals of stigma, um, you know, that sometimes individuals who are positive put on themselves because of the expectations of their families, their right. religious backgrounds, et cetera, their communities, but then also the things that they hear in the larger culture. So we have that. But then we also have um, the kind of, as, as Antoine was just describing, the issues um, that if you are black, say if you are poor, if you, we are more likely to be unstably housed, to be, uh, or homeless, to have mm -hmm. um, job instability or unemployment, and all the things that can lead to various kinds of economic and social instability. Mm -hmm. And if you're an LGBT person and you get kicked out of your parents' house for being, uh, you know, mm -hmm. young gay man or young trans woman or trans men or whatever, any of those things that make you, uh, kind of economically and physically unstable mm -hmm. will predispose you to contracting HIV. It sounds like a perfect cocktail for people with mental health issues and people who have been displaced by their communities to end up not just coming in contact with something like AIDS, HIV, but also with addiction and with drugs and things like that. Like, is that like an issue that people are seeing? The question is kind of a chicken and an egg question. Right. 
which comes first, the mental health or the addiction? And unfortunately, for I think for con bureaucratic convenience, the federal government has conflated both mental health and substance use. Mm -hmm. It is possible that mental health destabilization can precipitate and lead to uh, uh, substance use, abuse, and addiction. Mm -hmm. It also is possible that a substance use and abuse addiction without any prior mental health issues can trigger, precipitate, and exacerbate okay. an underlying. But it does not mean that somebody who's mental, dealing with a mental health issue is going to con going right. to become an addict. Can you talk to me a little bit, because we're in the holiday season, and this will actually air after, um, like, the big holiday season. But one of the things that comes up over and over over the holiday season are people who feel like they don't have a home to go to. Maybe they don't have a community or a friend group. Um, so you have both the aspect of people who have either just been outright rejected from their families and then don't have a um, sort of, you know, biological family to return to if, um, you know, for the holiday season. I mean, then you have folks who, for they kind of in theory can <laughs> come home, but mm -hmm. as long as they don't ever mention or don't right. ever or don't discuss, bring partner, don't bring the partner, don't, right? Yeah. Any any of these things mm -hmm. um, that can uh, also exacerbate, um, you know, kind of mental health issues. And I think um, one of the, I think the great things that we have in our community, and I think that we should use more is, I mean, people, um, you know, within LGBT communities, particularly folks of color, um, you know, build other kinds of, like, you know, kind of what we call sort of chosen family structures, yes. right, to mm -hmm. kind of be able to celebrate. And, and we're, it's interesting because we're also just beginning to see this nationally. So I just, this year, was really fascinated to see on so many different people on my, like, Facebook timeline or whatever, who, you know, were talking about their, like, friends giving, right? So people mm -hmm. are doing things with their friends before they go home, if they are going yeah. home to, think, you know, for Thanksgiving or whatever. And so I think those kinds of things are really, really important so that people can still plug into a sense of community and right. be able to celebrate the holidays with people who love and, and, and care for them as a kind of a chosen family if they aren't able to, um, to do so with their, their biological um, families as well. What does the community need right now? What do you guys think for the work you do, for the kind of change that you want to see happen in this space? What do we need? How much time do we have? <laughs> Not much more, actually. We've got under a minute. Because, you know, this you just asking a question here that's going to, like, leading down a rabbit hole. Right. I think one of the things, and I understand that you had a previous guest that talked about stigma, and yes. Ken is also talking about stigma. Yes. There is still stigma surrounding mental health. Mm -hmm. There is still stigma surrounding sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. There is still stigma surrounding HIV. And people of color communities are still being affected by that. Absolutely. All three as rolled in, either singly or collectively as one. Right. What I think is needed for people, LGBT people of color communities, mm -hmm. is a list. One is, first of all, that LGBT people of color look to themselves mm. for acceptance. Look to so simply when you look in the mirror, what do you see looking back at you? Mm -hmm. Who do you see looking back at you? How often have you stood butt naked in front of a mirror and looked at yourself, turned around and accepted every single part of you? So that is self acceptance. Mm -hmm. And that is the beginning of also encouraging others to accept you for who you are. Absolutely. I think the, the critical thing we need is to fight for comprehensive health care in this country, which includes right. mental health treatment. I mean, I think that has been the issue this year, and I think that we need to continue to fight to ensure, and yes, we have to fight the stigma so that, you know, mm -hmm. black folks and LGBT folks will take advantage of various kinds of mental health, you know, that's available, right. but we have to fight to make sure that people have that system in place to be able to use. Thank Hard you. I agree. I, ha I have to <laughs> shut it down, guys. I really do wish I had more time, because there's so much still to say on this subject. I appreciate you coming on. We'll have you back. We will keep having this conversation, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next, he represented Harlem in Congress for a quarter century. 
That was almost 50 years ago. What do we know about Adam Clayton Powell Jr. and his legacy today? One Man Seeks to Educate Us Through Theater, coming up next. Adam Clayton Powell Jr. was the first individual of African American descent voted to Congress from New York State. He represented Harlem for a distinguished 26 years before losing his seat to Charles Rangel. But what else do we know about this civil rights icon? A new play at the Billie Holiday Theater in Brooklyn seeks to inform us. And we have its writer and actor on today to tell us about the play and the politician. Michael Chenevert, welcome to 112BK. <laughs> It's a pleasure, pleasure, pleasure to be here. I'm so excited to have you. <laughs> um, one of the things that I read before you came on is that people in your community when you were a kid called you Little Adam. Yes, Where'd that did. come from? Well, my family in Detroit, Michigan, this mm -hmm. is where I grew up, it was a predominantly African-American community. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, had a, we had a community center called Operation Get Down. Oh. Literally, that was the name of it, Operation Get Down, uh, established in 1970. And uh, so there were some people, who, Dick Gregory used to come by, all mm -hmm. these different activists. And, yeah, exactly. And then we had a book drive. And then one day, one of these activists picked up the book, picked up one book and said, you know, you look like one of our baddest leaders. Right. So he opened the book and it looked like, wow, that looks like my dad, you know. Wow. So it gave me so much power um, at that present moment as a young kid that I looked like one of our baddest leaders, you know. Oh, yeah. That's bad meaning good, not bad meaning Yeah. Bad. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, you know, one of the things people say when it comes to representation, um, especially for kids, it's like it's really hard to be what you can't see. Mm. If you see someone who looks like you doing amazing things, then you feel like you could also do amazing things. Exactly. It's like we just feel connected to exactly. it. Exactly. So, Someone who, you know, maybe knows a lot, maybe knows very little mm -hmm. about Powell, what can they expect to see and experience in this show you've written? Well, it's interesting that you just said uh, to see someone. Mm -hmm. And uh, we put our heroes a lot up on these pedestals. And um, uh, to have an intimate experience with Adam is really what I want people to walk away from. Mm -hmm. To see a three-dimensional man up here uh, speaking politics. He was a legislator. Right. Which is the biggest thing about Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Mm -hmm. that uh, distinguishes him from Martin Luther King, say, or Malcolm right. X. Uh, he also he protested in the streets, but he also protested in the in the Capitol, walking right. up and down those aisles. I mean, from the day one, he was had a fiery tongue, and he uh, brought uh, African Americans into the uh, cafeteria, you know, because mm -hmm. Washington D.C. is in the South. So I want I want that, but I also want you to see, you know, some of the demons and the things that he was dealing with at that time. I mean, loss, right. you know, he was, his wife was now an expatriate in, in, um, in France, uh, and she was going to leave him. Uh, he had voted for a Republican mm -hmm. around this time, so the Democrats were after him as well. So there were some things going on, but it's, and we also talked about this right before we started uh, the interview, right. was about a movement. Mm -hmm. um, he was involved with a movement, and he just, he had to stay on that train, you know, that, right. that movement train. So it was no quitting for him. So he fought through his demons, mm -hmm. and uh, that's what makes him heroic. I think there are a lot of people that, when you hear 60s civil rights icon, mm -hmm. don't then think controversy, and especially not controversy within the movement. Mm. But Mr. Mm. Powell did have some controversy yeah. within the movement. He didn't necessarily rock with Martin Luther King Jr., no, did he? No, he did not rock with Martin Luther King. One. Adam Clayton Powell had been doing this for 25 years, mm -hmm. and Martin Luther King came on the scene in 1955. Right. So my play is 1957. Right. Right. So um, so here's this young whippersnapper coming up and is stealing all his glory. Mm -hmm. He was Mr. Civil Rights. Right. And now uh, Martin Luther King became Mr. Civil Rights. Mm -hmm. So we addressed that actually in this play, uh, what he felt about Martin Luther King and uh, and it's about him actually getting his recognition again. Oh. So yeah, so that's the fight. That's the conflict. Right. The conflict is really this is what I do, and this is what I did, and, right. uh, and I'm, I'm going to get my wife back, you yeah. know, you know, and all <laughs> that. Right, exactly. So, so that's, the, that's, the, that's the drive of this play. Whenever things like this happen, especially like we're talking about civil rights leaders mm -hmm. right now, Oprah gave an, emo an amazing speech last night, and now people are talking about her running right. for politics. Like, there are all these conversations happening around it constantly right mm -hmm. now. Um, mm -hmm. Politics are just like, there's something that we can't really afford to ignore anymore. No. Civil rights aren't either. So, can you tell me, like, the timing mm -hmm. of a play like this mm -hmm. in a time like this? Mm -hmm. Was that intentional or is that fake? It's so amazing. Let me tell you, I've 
I've ri I wrote, started writing, I started doing research on this play in 2009. Mm -hmm. I started really kind of writing it, putting pen to paper, uh, 2015. And I swear, uh, with hidden figures now, because mm -hmm. um, I mentioned Sputnik in here, and I mentioned how we have brilliant black scientists in this country. Yes. I also mentioned how back in 1952, there was a running mate um, with Adlai Stevenson, who was actually a segregationist. So I well, go, well, what, you know, I say, what kind of mess would we be in if we had a segregationist who was a vice president? Right. We got a segregationist now in the White mm -hmm. House. Um, and now with uh, the movement of women being, um, being uh, accepted and, and, and actually uh, being able to come forth with their own, you know, mm -hmm. what, what's happening with them. And um, what, what Oprah was talking about last night, now I'm talking about in my play, that's what I thought, I was like, this is so amazing because it's so prevalent right now about uh, how women of power that, okay, I'll, I'll just say the line. <laughs> yeah. I was trying not to say a line in my play, but I will say it. Same. I say, well, in Adam's generation, they learned to burn. Mm -hmm. And this generation, which I'm talking to the women in, in the show, I say, uh, in your generation, they're learning to learn. Mm -hmm. And after you, those women will learn to earn. Mm -hmm. You know, So it's like this evolution of the women's power movement in my play as well. So right. When do I come? Okay, well, we have a limited engagement, and that's okay. this weekend. It's January 12th, 13th, and 14th. Mm -hmm. And uh, the shows, I believe, are 8 p.m., 8 p.m., and 3 p.m. Um, so that's 8 p.m. on Friday, 8 p.m. on Saturday, 3 p.m on uh, Sunday, mm -hmm. and you can buy tickets yes. <laughs> at, um, at BillyHolliday.org. Billy so Billy. Billy Holiday, you know, the, the wonderful mm -hmm. jazz musician, and right. that's not spelled with a Y, but spelled with an I-E. Just like my right. grandmother. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah. She was named after Billy Holiday? She well. was. Wonderful. So BillyHolliday.org, mm -hmm. you can buy tickets there. Fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm so happy to be here. Thank, Thank you. you. It's really good meeting you. Lovely meeting you <laughs> okay. as well. How do, you how do you preserve your cherished family photos? Our next guest will share with us his vision. If you're like me, you've got hundreds of photos on your phone of family and friends. My phone's actually getting better at organizing these images into albums. But is this the best way to preserve these memories? Our next guest has another idea, and he's turned it into a TV show. It's called Family Pictures USA, and he's here to tell us about it. Welcome to 112BK, Thomas. Thank you, Ashley. Good to be here. I'm so excited about this conversation because, first of all, I love photos. Mm -hmm. um, I take photos. I keep so many photos, as many as I possibly can. Um, so th this is just such an interesting idea to me because I know so many stories lie in photos, and especially family stories. So could you first just let me know, do you describe yourself as a filmmaker, a photographer, a documentarian, like how do you describe what you do? All of the above. All of the yeah, above. And in fact, I, you know, I'm an artist. Yeah. And so, um, so I've been making films for about 20 years mm -hmm. and all of the films I've made and some have somehow been inspired by my grandfather's photographic archive. Mm -hmm. um, every time I make a new film, like I made a film about black photographers, I found mm -hmm. these amazing photographs that he had collected, taken by New York City black photographers. Wow. And so it's just been, um, it's, so I, f I feel like um, the kind of work I do is part artist, part mm -hmm. activist. I'm interested in bringing new stories in through the family photographs, as you right. said, because so many of our stories are there. Mm -hmm. And especially for black people, I feel like it's so mm -hmm. hard to trace our histories and to have that um, real family thread and familial to be perfectly honest, like ancestral connection without photographs. Mm -hmm. And one of the places that I've seen a lot of stuff done, um, especially when it comes to black families and memories and tracing of families is PBS, where you used to work, right? Mm -hmm. So how yeah. did working at PBS inform what you do now? Um, well, um, my relationship with PBS has mm -hmm. evolved over years. I actually yes. started as a, in my 20s, and that was a long time ago, believe it or not. And uh, you may believe it pretty I easily. I don't, actually. Like, I'm looking at you like, OK, you're saying a long time ago with 20s. Let's, I hope this all comes together in my head. But go ahead. But like, I, I would say in the, in the late 80s, mm -hmm. I was working as a young producer in PBS, um, Channel 13, WNET, and I was producing public affairs shows. Mm -hmm. And then later on, I left. Uh, public television, I started teaching, I started making these kind of experimental films. Right. Um, and then I um, uh, came back mm -hmm. with, started doing my own films, and I sold them to PBS. Wow. And to more specifically Independent Lens and POV. And now, 
public television is investing in the TV show. Oh, so it's like this this journey, you know, and I think it's so like public television for me is so important. The Family Pictures USA project. Um, you're telling me that PBS is investing in it, but what is it? Like, how, how is the setup? Give me a little bit about the nuts and bolts of the project. How does it work? Oh, okay. So, um, I have been doing these projects where I take photographs into communities mm -hmm. and I help communities tell their collective story. So, like in 2002, I went to South Africa. My mm -hmm. stepdad's from South Africa. Mm -hmm. And he left with 11 other guys to spread the anti apartheid uh, mission across mm -hmm. the globe. And most of those guys took up the gun and went back to Southern Africa to fight South Africa. But my dad took the camera. Mm -hmm. And he came to this country and started working as a photographer, as an archivist. And he left this huge archive behind. So when South Africa was free, he moved back home. Mm -hmm. But I had the family album, so I took right. it back. And most people didn't understand what had happened outside in the outside countries, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of the evolution of the anti-apartheid movement. Mm -hmm. So I was like the missing link, you know, this photographic album. So I got these young South Africans to look at the album and to intersect and interview the people who had been away and came mm -hmm. back. And they created this large kind of, we, together we created this film called 12 Disciples right. of Nelson Mandela. And wow. so they were able to fill in this missing bit of history and these are like people in their 20s, at least they were in their 20s 10 years ago. Right. And so, um, so it's been like, you know, so that's, that's the kind of work I do. So, so with Family Pictures, I am kind of bringing the photograph back into communities and getting mm -hmm. people to think about uh, the family album. You know, the yeah. family album has shifted. It's, it's, it we're has. no longer printing stuff out and making books. Mm -hmm. Now we have to figure out a new way of like, um, engaging in the family album and for me it's a tool to bring people together and to see our humanity to see our specialness and to see each other not simply through the lens of um, uh, through the lens of the superficial right but our familial connections I love that so now I want to see it mm -hmm. how do I go see it? how does all of us how do we go see it um, mm. well it's uh, <laughs> well first of all we're doing a crowdsource campaign funding campaign right and, um, and so we, people can go to FamilyPicturesUSA.com mm -hmm. and they can check us out on Family Pictures USA and they can see clips of the film right. and the TV show rather. And, um, and then they can also support us because mm -hmm. we're doing, we're going to be filming for the next year and right. then it's going to be broadcast in 2018, 2019. Wow. That sounds amazing, and I can't wait to get into it. I can't wait for more people to see it. I hope that they come to the website, and they check it out, and they donate. I know that I will be because I'm a bleeding heart, and also because this just sounds like a fantastic idea. This is the kind of stuff I want to see on TV. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, I Ashley. really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. It's great to be here. It's so lovely to have you. Thanks for joining us today. On tomorrow's show, immigration and customs making bus in city courts the anti-violence project after a violent year, and a time-warping, genre-bending, Afro-futuristic voyage. Join us then.